Hello everybody, welcome back to our class on uh, the Black African People Cast. No, they are not. <laughs> Go share the message if you can, because right now you are going to find out some very interesting things that will be an encouragement and a surprise to you. So today's topic is African contribution to Western European civilization. African contribution to Western European civilization. So here we go. In this teaching, where we will get acquainted with creators of Europeans, Europe history in the post medieval period. So this is after the Moors have ruled Europe. And uh, so the blacks remained in Europe. And so, you know, of course, some of them were, most of the black people were expelled from Europe, but some of them, you know, re remained here. So, and they contributed to the building of the modern Europe that we have today, especially the cultural and civilization, the European civilization that followed. So, appearance of racism is linked to the era of geographical discoveries by Europeans that gave start to the so called modern age Europe. Yeah, the Europeans, uh, you know, the, the discrimination and racism started because of, of course, the presence of Moors because they came here and they dominated Europeans and they oppressed them. And so, of course, that brought some hatred. And so when they left Europe, they went to Africa and, and other parts of the world, they became powerful and their civilization had grown. Then they went with a revenge, I mean, with a vengeance and dominated uh, other parts of the world, Africa especially. Theories of ancestral inferiority of some peoples were shaped to justify colonization policies that were often accompanied by extermination or enslavement of local inhabitants. According to racist standpoints, racial differences have a decisive influence on history and culture. You will be able to confirm the opposite, not only in terms of African and black people civilizations considered earlier, but also in terms of specific persons that lived in the period of development of racism and were is living uh, refutation. The people of the modern age in Europe was determined by spiritual and cultural factors. Uh, the period, sorry, the period of the modern age in Europe was determined by spiritual and cultural factors. It will therefore be very important to pay attention to the spiritual and cultural life of African notable figures. So there were popular Africans in Europe at that time. And, and there in my book, uh, you know, uh, How Africans Brought Civilization to Europe. So we are going to be talking about the civilization of this, that these Africans brought. In relation to Western Europe, we will focus on individuals who influence music, literature, spirituality, philosophy, and politics, because these are the things that people think are the basis of uh, civilization in Europe. But even in that area, apart from the war and military uh, part of Europe, you know, even in the area of culture, literature, music, and philosophy, politics, you will see black men playing a prominent role in developing these things in Europe. In addition to their achievements, little known facts concerning their ties to their African roots will also be highlighted. Now, Joseph Ballon des, des Saint, a judge, a French composer by nickname Black Mozart, Joseph Ballon, Black Mozart, they call him, was a French composer of classical music, conductor, violin, virtuoso, royal musketeer, who received a nickname Black uh, Mozart. His mother was an African slave <clears throat> and his father was a French plantation owner born in the French colony of uh, uh, Guadeloupe. He achieved the highest social status in France thanks to his fencing skills and genius in European classical music. His diverse career is beautifully depicted in a painting by Mathera Brown, an American historical artist painted in London in 1787. The portrait depicts him dressed as a conductor, but instead of his baton, he is holding his sword. <laughs> he was later named Chevalier uh, de Saint George, which was a noble title. 
Europeans at that time considered Africans an inferior race and because of his African origin, because that was colonization period, St. George was restricted in many rights under the French law. Mixed marriages were banned at that time because they wanted to banish all the memory of uh, Moors who had ruled over them. And at, as he found himself part of a despised social class of mulattoes, however, thanks to his uh, continuing efforts, he not only conceded, I mean, he not only succeeded, but also overcame the existing racial barriers. During his education, by day, he learned mathematics, history, foreign languages, music, drawing, and dancing. And after that, he studied fencing. The son, of a or the son of his teacher, a famous fencer, Nicolas Texier de la uh, Boussier, stated that even at the age of 15, he won from the best fencing masters. And at 17, he developed the highest speed of movement one could imagine. He was often seen swimming to the other bank of the Seine, using only one arm. In running, he was one of the fastest in Europe. He mastered uh, Asphicord and Violin and he was, he was accepted into the Royal uh, Gendarmerie as a Violin uh, Virtuoso. He gave concerts in England and France. St. George also became a member of a famous French composer, Gossec Orchestra, and soon became his conductor. In the Music Almanac magazine, the orchestra was named the best in Paris and perhaps in Europe. He then headed the uh, Masonic Olympic Lodge Orchestra. He was one of the first black Masons in France. Masons. The orchestra ordered six so-called Paris symphonies from the Austrian composer Haid and under the direction of Chevalier the son judge played them for the first time. French Queen Marie Antoinette attended the premiere and she loved the 85th symp uh, symposium uh, symphony, which was then hence named the Queen. French King Louis VI, uh, I mean Louis the Sixteenth, was going to appoint Chevalier de Saint George as director of the Royal Opera, but the appointment was not made due to protests of several artists who, though it below, uh, who, who, thought it, who thought it below their dignity to work under the direction of a mulatto. <laughs> St. George is the author of concert symphonies, string quartets, va violin concerts, sonatas for violin, and have secret and musical comed comedies. He directed the private musical theater of Madame de Montesson, the wife of the Duke of Orleans, and gave music lessons to Queen Marie Antoinette. He is known for, can you imagine it, he was the teacher of the queen of the, of the country. He is known for his fencing fight with the legendary Chevalier Dion in the presence of the Prince of Wales, future King George IV, he was also the first black color, uh, colonel of the French army. Wow. Today, there are streets named after him in Guadeloupe and in Paris. On the example of his life, we can see a, significant, a magnificent will of a black man who, despite con contemptuous disregard of him by part of society, became so successful and influential through his hard work. Let's talk about another person today, Alexandro de Medici. De Medici. Alexandro de Medici, uh, the black head of the Republic of Florence. Uh, Alexandro de Medici was the first black head of state in modern history of the West. So he was like the president of a country that time, because Florence that time was an independent state. He was the first one, that was before the unity, the unification of Italy. He was the first one from a senior line of the Medici who ruled Florence, wearing the title of Duke. 
He was also the Duke of the Italian city of Penn. His father was either Lorenzo II, the Medici, grandson of Lorenzo the Magnificent, <coughs> or Giulio de Medici, Medici, later Pope Clement VII, nephew of Lorenzo the Magnificent. Historians suggested that he was born to a black woman who was a servant at the Medici house. In documents, she is mentioned as Simonetta da Colevecio. Alexandro's nickname was the was the Mon, the Black, which related to his appearance. They used to call him the Black. That was the king of the of the country. In 1531, 19-year-old Alessandro became the ruler of the Republic of Florence with the title Capo, the head, the head of state. The head of the Republic was a member of all government committees and also held the position of Gonfalonier of Justice for the time of his life. That's Minister of Justice as well. One year later, Emperor Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire granted him the hereditary title of Duke. The Emperor supported Alessandro in his struggle against pro-Republic uh, Florentines. He even married off his daughter Margherita to him. This is a very significant moment usually in a society where racism is pre present. People never want to marry their daughter to a black man. It means we have something to learn from the emperor who made the greatest contribution to history among the rulers of that time. A black monk of the Franciscan order, St. Benedict the Moor, which, which it was called the Black Moor, is black, also known as St. Benedict the Black, was a monk of the Franciscan order and is now venerated in Catholic and Lutheran churches. He was born into a, uh, you know, St. Benedict. I'm sure many people know about St. Benedict, right? He was a black man. He was born into a family of African Christian slaves living in Sicily, Italy. Because of his parents' dedicated service, he was granted freedom at 18 years of age. He did not attend any school and remained illiterate for the rest of his life. Huh. Joining a local hermit group, he became their leader and made a pilgrimage to Syria and Egypt. Syria and Egypt that time used to be Christian, but that was before the yeah. So although he was on it before the Muslims took over, although he was unable to read, he was highly respected for the deepest, most extensive and insightful understanding of theology and the scripture, and was frequently consulted for guidance and advice. It is also known that miracles of healings of the sick occurred through him. They say he predicted the day he was going to die. He was be, uh, beatified by Pope Benedict uh, XVI in 1714. Uh, in 1743, and canonized by Pope Pius uh, VII in 1807. So that was Pope Benedict XIV. Honoring St. Benedict, the more is common in the United States, Mexico, Central and South America, including Argentina, Brazil, and Venezuela. He is remembered for his self-possession uh, and self-control and sensitivity when he was humiliated on racial grounds. Later, he was declared the patron saint of African Americans. Okay, we're going to talk about another person that contributed greatly to the culture, to the European culture, Adolf Badin, an African servant of the server of the Swedish royal court. No, the servant, not in the terms of servant, like he was the manager of the of the royal court of Sweden, of the palace, like the prime minister. African Adolf Gustav Badin was an important member of the Swedish royal court. He was a butler of the Swedish queen. Louisa Ulrika of Prussia and Prince Princess Sophia Albertine. His real name was Kushi and he was born in 1747 either in Africa or in St. Croix in the Caribbean Sea, which was a Danish colony. He also remembered that when he had been a child, he had lived in an unbearable hot cabin. 
1757, a captain of a Danish ship has brought Badin and later gave him as a present to the Queen of Sweden. <laughs> Can you imagine? Lu Luisa Ulrika. Under her guidance, Badin was converted to Christianity, learned French, German, and Latin. His childhood friend was the king, the future king of Sweden, Gustav III, and other members of the royal family. They say that Badin knew all the secrets of the royal entourage. He was very straightforward and spoke on, on equal terms even with the king and the queen. On their deathbed, the queen sent Badin to Stockholm, giving him the keys to her personal files. That's how much she trusted him and was sure of him. Later, when these files were safely handed over to the prince and the princess, they burned them and King Gustav III became furious and wanted to kill Badin. To this threat, he only replied, My head is in the power of your majesty, but I could not act in a different way. In this case, we see a man of honor who, even under the threat of death, could remain faithful to his princess. Promises. On Princess, princess Sophia Albertina's birthday, he wrote to her, I, one of the black people, unfamiliar with this country's customs, still send best wishes from my heart to our princess too. Badin played in theater and was a ballet dancer. He sometimes helped Carl Michael Bell Bellman, a Swedish poet and composer, to write poems for special events and some of them were published under his name. Among, the, among other things, he was a traveling ambassador, a royal forecaster, and a court chess player. He, his library consisted of up to 900 different volumes. He was granted several titles such as Chamberlain, that is the manager of the chamber of the palace, court secretary, uh, ballet master, and official state servant, he, like state representative. He was part of a number of fraternities, orders, and Masonic lodges. He was described as an intellectual, trustworthy, and confident. His journals, written in French, are kept in the Uppsala University Library. This African is appealing not only because he was a good public servant and very versatile as a human being, but especially because of his personality. Any state, any state leader, and indeed any superior, uh, would like to see as part of their staff an African like this, who would not trade his honor for anything, even under the threat of death. Okay, I will stop on this one. I will stop here, and then I will uh, maybe, do I have more time to continue? Let me see. Maybe I should do this one too before going on. Okay, let me do this one too. Uh, Juan Latino, a black Spanish scholar and poet of the 16th century. Okay, let's do Juan Latino. Juan Latino, 1518 to 1597, was born into a family of African slaves from West Africa and became a professor of, of rhetorics, Greek, and Latin at the University of Granada in the 16th century. He was brought to Spain from Africa. In his youth, he studied Latin and Greek and studied from the University of Granada. He became so skillful in Latin that he changed his, his slave name and became known as Juan Latino. He published three volumes of poems. His heroic poem, Austria, uh, Austria Carmen, was devoted to the victory of Spanish warlord John of Austria in the War of the uh, Alpujarras. He is considered the first representative of the Negro peoples to have published a collection of poems in a European language. Know that this is not the first time that Africans became outstanding individuals despite their starting conditions. It is very significant that without any fortunate fashion, starting platform, Africans have been able to achieve spectacular results. Okay, we'll go to Duma from France later on. All right, so this is where we start. I mean, that's where we stop for today. Later on, I will show you a video. But uh, before then, let's go ahead and share this message. Share, share, share. And uh, also, if you want to join my mentorship program,
please go ahead and uh, go to sundayatelijahblog.com slash mentorship. If you want to help us go back to Africa to do uh, more work in Africa to re revive the glory of Africa, go to sundayatelijahblog.com slash Nigeria. If you want to get my books, you can go to sundayatelijahblog.com as well slash books. If you wish to come to, for training in history makers training, you go to sonadlegerblog.com slash HMT. You can also read my books for free on Kindle Unlimited. So that's it for today. Tomorrow we'll continue. Thank you so much. Peace. In the year 1745, in the town of Osaka in the district of Ibo, within the Kingdom of Benin, in present-day eastern Nigeria, a child by the name of Olauda Equiano was born. Olauda, in the Ibo people's native language, signifies vicissitude or fortune, also one favored in having a loud voice and well-spoken. Unbelievably describing what his life would be like, one filled with fortune in the face of numerous evils. Equiano grew up in a remote, yet fertile and rich land of dancers, musicians, and poets. Major events were usually celebrated with these. The lifestyle of the evil people was simple, and everyone dressed the same. Convenience was valued over ornament, and wants were few and easily supplied. They valued marriage and hygiene greatly, and believed in one creator of all things. As well, since many of them were involved in labor from young ages, regardless of gender, they were greatly sought after by European slave traders. Olauda was the youngest of his siblings and the favorite of his mother. His father was a village leader and owner of slaves himself. And from a young age, he was trained in the art of war. His future seemed to be a prosperous one as he came from a successful family and was most likely to be a leader in his community following in his father's footsteps. However, everything changed when at age 11, while the elders worked, and him and his sister stayed home alone, two men and a woman captured them and took them into the woods. Like prisoners, they tied their hands together and they walked on, stopping a few places at a time, until him and his sister were finally split up. This brought immense sorrow to Olauda, who was only a young boy. Despite this, he was kept days and months traveling, jumping from one master's home to another. However, many were kind to him, he kept going this way from master to master until, in the middle of the night, he was taken away. They were taking him to the coast. And they traveled for six or seven months, sometimes by land and sometimes by water, through different countries, kingdoms, and nations until they finally got there. The first things he noticed were the sea and the slave ship. He was amazed, but the feeling quickly turned into terror when he was taken in. In his narrative, he describes the atmosphere in the ship as so. The stench of the hold while we were on the coast was so intolerably loathsome that it was dangerous to remain there for any time. The closeness of the place and the heat of the climate added to the number in the ship which was so crowded that each had scarcely room to turn himself almost suffocated us. This produced copious perspirations so that the air soon became unfit for respiration from a variety of loathsome smells, and brought on a sickness among the slaves, of which many died. This wretched situation was again aggravated by the galling of the chains, now become insupportable, and the filth of the necessary tubs, into which the children often fell and were almost suffocated. The shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying rendered the whole a scene of horror almost inconceivable. The ship took them to Bridgetown, on the island of Barbados to be bought. But nobody bought Equiano, so he was boarded on the ship again with all the unsaleable slaves and was taken to the colony of Virginia in the United States. There he was bought by a Mr. Campo, but he was soon bought again by a friend of Mr. Campo's who liked Olauda very much and wanted to take him back to England as a present for his friends. His name was Michael Henry Pascal and he was a lieutenant of the Royal Army who also happened to own a trading ship. 
Olauda was taken on Pascal's trading ship full of crops, which was more comfortable than the horrendous slave ships. There, he changed his name to Gustavus Vasa, what he became mostly known as for the rest of his life. And he met Richard Baker, a white, educated American who would become his friend, companion, interpreter, and teacher for the next two years. On the spring of 1757, they reached England. 12-year-old Alauda marveled at the sight of snow, thinking that it was salt at first, and was taken to church for the first time. He was also surprised at the differences in customs between the Europeans and his people. A little after their arrival in England, his master took him and Richard to the island of Guernsey where they would stay with a family, who treated them as part of their own. By the summer of 1757, they had left Guernsey and returned to England. Pascal had been assigned on the warship HMS Roebuck, which fought the French in Canada over control of territories. Young Lauda was taken with the master on this trip. He witnessed attacks and deaths on both sides. And in 1978, he was present at the siege of Louisbourg in Nova Scotia. After spending most of his time at sea, he was sent to London, where shortly after arriving, his master ordered him to wait on the Miss Garrett, who were two sisters. They treated him kindly and sent him to school, so that he could learn to read and write. While he was with them, he also became baptized in 1759 at St. Margaret's Church, Westminster, although Pascal was hesitant to allow this at first. Eventually, Alauda left them because an expedition had begun for the Mediterranean on a boat named the Namur. On the ship, Pascal told them to inquire about his friend Richard, as he had been assigned to another ship and Alauda had not seen him since. Here, he found out of his death, which deeply affected him. While on the Namur, he also became involved in battles between the British and the French, as the French attacked their ship. He got himself in impossible situations, and despite getting into these situations, he always seemed to be one to survive unscathed. Instances like these shaped his belief that he was being protected. After their encounter with the French, the British retreated. But after Pascal had recovered, him and Alauda boarded once more another ship, the Aitina. Here, Equiano was a steward, and he enjoyed this job as it allowed him time to learn important skills and improve his reading and writing. On November 1762, there were finally talks of peace and their boat returned to England. At this time, his thoughts of freedom and desires to read and write grew. Pascal, threatened by these ideas of freedom, betrayed him by selling him to a Captain Doran. And although Alauda refused, saying that it was illegal to sell a baptized man, it was no use. And he was sold and taken to the West Indies to serve for a Mr. King. He soon realized that he had landed in one of the best hands in the West Indies. Mr. King was a great master, and this was made even more clear when he began to be a witness to all the horrors around him. Other masters took advantage of women and young girls, they abused their slaves and treated them like savages, they had no care for their conditions or health and they only cared for the work they could get from them. One day, Captain Thomas Farmer, the captain of one of Mr. King's ships, let Mr. King know of the challenges of the trip due to the irresponsible crew who was always drinking and rarely doing any of the actual work. The captain had taken a particular liking to Alauda, so he asked Mr. King to let him work on board. After hesitantly allowing him to be part of the crew a few times, Alauda decided to become a permanent member. While he traveled with the captain, his thoughts of freedom grew until he was thinking about it constantly. One day, his master called for him to tell him that he meant to sell him because he had been made aware that he planned to run away. This was not entirely true, as Equiano would never actually betray Mr. King like that. With the help of the captain, he convinced Mr. King that this information was false, as Equiano had had plenty of opportunities, but he had never taken them. In turn, Mr. King then offered Alauda his freedom. If he could pay him back the 40 shillings that he had paid for him initially, he would be free. 
Finally, at 21 years old, through a small personal trading business that he had created, Alauda got the money to pay him. And although hesitant at first, with the help of the kind captain, Mr. King again accepted. And in the year 1766, Alauda Equiano bought his freedom. The captain died a few months later, and if he had not survived to help with Equiano's freedom, he may have not even gotten it at all. This was something he credited to his believed celestial protection. Although he was now a free man, he stayed working for Mr. King for a while. But his life as a free slave in the West Indies was a dangerous one with no security or protection. So, he returned to England. For a while, he worked as a hairdresser, but he was struggling for money, so he returned to the seas. Although this was good at first, when he was to return and make his trip back to England alone, he encountered some trouble. He was tricked onto a ship and almost sold back into slavery. However, by pure chance and luck alone, he was saved by a man who knew his friend, and he was soon again freed. In the end, in January of 1777, he returned to England. Here, he became involved in the anti-slavery movement as an active abolitionist. He lectured against the cruelty of the British slave owners, spoke out against the slave trade, and worked to settle freed slaves, specifically in Sierra Leone, a British colony. In 1789, he published his narrative, The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Alauda Equiano or Gustavus Vasa the African. It became a bestseller in England and became considered the originator of the slave narrative. In 1972, He was married to a white woman named Susanna Cullen, which was almost unheard of at the time as interracial marriages were very scandalous occurrences. He was also believed to have two daughters, Anna and Maria. His wife passed away in 1796 and he died a year later in London on March 31st at the age of 52 years old. In the last pages of his narrative he wrote, Tortures, murder, and every other imaginable barbarity and iniquity are practiced upon the poor slaves with impunity. I hope the slave trade will be abolished. Little did he know that in 1797, ten years after his death, his wish was going to come true and the English slave trade was going to be abolished.